I don't want to touch either one of those. Oh man, you know, uh, first of all, I'm only going to answer one of those. I'm trying to pick, pick the lesser of two evils. Um, oh, it's both are bad, you know. Darn if I do, darn if I don't. Um, favorite person to have coffee with, man. I don't <laughs> I really don't know. I, I, I don't know what to say. Um, I, I'm going to answer your second one. I'm going to have to decline. <laughs> she, well, she took the microphone. She can't talk. <laughs> don't give her the microphone again. <laughs> yes, have you found yourself saying Sweet Christmas outside of the show or wearing yellow more or less outside the show? And have you worn yellow by accident and you find yourself being noticed a lot more <laughs> simply because of what you're wearing? You know, uh, honestly, I would like to say that every time I see anything yellow, I'm very aware of it. Uh, I don't accidentally put anything on yellow um, or mustard, but when I do put it on, it's intentional. I think I've worn it literally, I can count on one hand one, two, three. I'm gonna wear, uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna wear it again in a couple weeks. I literally, when I wear it, it is just, I'm literally, I know exactly. I mean, it's not like I'm wearing it and it's like, oh, I'm wearing yellow. I'm doing it for a reason, so I'm very careful with it. Um, if you saw the second season, which some of you have not finished, and I'm sure, but I'm not gonna spoil it or anything, but in the last scene, the color of that, of what I was wearing, was chosen because I wanted to wear it to pay, you know, pay homage again to the color, the, his, his color. Um, and we talked about that like before the season started. As soon as we knew that that, that was going to be what he was wearing, as far as like the type of clothing, I said, let's get this color and let's make it work. Let's try and find some way rich, some some rich uh, textured material to sort of like really be subtle about it, but at the same time. Kind of, kind of, you know, let people see that it's it's a subtle thing. I mean, most people probably completely saw it. It's like a mustard color. Um, so yeah, I'm very aware of it. Um, I never say sweet Christmas ever, um, <laughs> ever, ever, ever. Um, and uh, what? Yes, yes. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, as Luke Cage, you got to uh, take a lot of hits and have to not feel it. So what kind of preparations do you do uh, to work on those action scenes? You know, it's just, I think you, you do them enough, you get used to the squibbing, you get used to the, 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 the firing of the, of the, the weapons and stuff. It's, it's not, it's, I never look forward to it because it's sort of a, I mean, I don't know, because I'm always thinking something's going to go wrong, to be honest, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'll be honest. Every time we do it, it's like, I'm like, oh boy, I hope this thing goes well, because, you know, it's like so, somewhat like pyrotechnics a little bit. You know, there's a lot of ways to do that sort of um, um, special effects. Like in uh, well, the film I just did recently, um, you can do it with CGI, but it, it looks more, I guess it looks more um, authentic. authentic if you do it the way we do it, but it does become like, you know, every time we have to do it, I'm like, oh boy, I gotta put this special clothing on and then and I have to prepare for this to happen. And when it happens, every, there's always people who, okay, they give instructions, this is what we're gonna do, and everybody has to remember that this is a, a, a dangerous situation. So you, you're doing, you can't stand over here, you can't do this and you can't do that, but meanwhile, I'm wearing this stuff. <laughs> you know, everyone's being protected, but I gotta wear it. And they're like, okay, don't put your hand over here and make sure you don't do this because if you have your head here, I'm like, you know, I get it, I know, I know, I've done this many times. Um, but ultimately, I just, I just can't wait for it to get over, to be honest, because I'm like, and I, and I hope, I hope they all go off, because we have a, it's a mechanism thing that if all these gunfires don't go off, we gotta do it again. So, if something happens, technically, I'm like, oh, this sucks. But yeah, it's, 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 it's something that I've gotten used to, so um, we, we do it, I try, I try to get to do it less as possible, you know what I mean? Because I don't want to, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to get shot all the time. <laughs> Over here? Yeah, um, my question is, how did you make Luke Cage, as an actor, your own character? How difficult was that? And do you ever in your daily life say, no, Luke Cage would not do this? <laughs> in my daily life or on set? On set. On set, yeah, for sure. I mean, there's directors that come in, we have a different director every episode, so I always, 
we know the characters as much as better than anyone else. So the directors come in and they sometimes watch all the previous episodes or their fans of the show or whatever, and they get up to date on what we're doing. So we're constantly trying to make sure that we are the keepers of the the authenticity of our characters. So I, I would I could definitely say there are many times they come up and I tell a director I'm going no, that's not we he wouldn't he wouldn't do that. And it's not a huge thing usually. It's very seldom is it a big thing where it's like no no we definitely don't want to do that and he and he, they push back because usually it's 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 obvious. It's like, oh yeah, for sure, that wouldn't, it wouldn't work. But um, as far as the character, um, I felt like when, when, the, when I got the job, one thing I had going for me is that um, I'm, I'm probably not the most, I, um, what's the guy that was, uh, I'm probably not the most predictable. If you were talking about being a black man, right, in this country, I'm not that predictable. Most of the stuff that I do in life and most of the stuff that I appreciate and most of the stuff that I believe in, it's not, it's not like on the nose. So I, I like to bring some sort of nuances to characters so it's not so like predictable, not so stereotypical. You know, it is, in this country being a black man, everybody thinks there, there are certain things that you must adhere to, there are certain things that you must believe in, there are certain things that you must, be, a certain way you have to behave. You know, there's, you know, in other cultures they call it machismo. I, I know Luke Cage is a brawny character and he's got, you know, he's got the muscle and he's, you know, he's athletic and he's strong. But ultimately I wanted the character to be, to be more of a thinker and more um, reflective and uh, self-reflective and understand like everything, you can't do everything with, with power and brute force. And I wanted to try to make sure that that people could understand the character and feel the character even when he wasn't in action because ultimately he didn't want to do what he has to do. He doesn't want to be a hero of Harlem. Hero of Harlem. He doesn't want to have to have this, this burden, um, this, this thing, this duty, but he has to do it and that's something that I think we all can understand like, because all of us really just want to go home and we all want to be with our families. We don't really want to deal with the stress of life. We don't want to have to engage in the bigger picture. You know, Think about it, we all have this have this, we're, we're, we're one community on the planet, you know, in this country, we're one community, and we all have to participate, otherwise nothing gets done. And sometimes we're forced to participate, sometimes we do it because we want to, but we all have to participate, or otherwise there's literally no, there's no way to make this thing work. So being a part of society, you know, Luke Cage is a part of a community too, a small community. He has to, he has to contribute, and what he's good at is, is stopping criminals, you know, chasing bad guys, um, people need him because he's indestructible. He, he, he comes to people's rescue. He has to do it because it's, 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 it's an obligation that, that he can't escape. You know, if you can do something for someone, you can't turn your back on them. Not if you have the ability to do better. You know what I mean? And we all have to contribute. And I think that's Luke's, Luke's, if you can relate to Luke, I think you can understand that if you were in his shoes, you wouldn't want to have to do it either. Because he's got his own things he wants to do. I think it was one thing he was talking to Bushmaster on the, on the bridge, and I don't want to be a spoiler, but he was talking about family. He was talking about what he would like to be doing as opposed as opposed to what he's doing. He doesn't really want to do it, and and, and that's something he he he's has he has to wrestle with because he can't just go leave New York City and drive down to down south and retire, and he can't just you know disappear or put his hands in his pocket. He's got to continue to do the fight the good fight. So until until further notice, he's got to continue to do. that. I think we all feel that sometimes. We all have to provide for our families. We all have to get up and early in the morning and go to work. That's that's hero work, man. That is hero work. My dad did it for God knows how many years. I don't know. I was like alarm clock even. Had one. He'd wake up at 4.30, drive people to work, drop them off at their jobs, go to his job, get off his job, go pick people up. This is all to make extra money. Drop them off at work. I would ride with him and I would just get that in my, my system. I was cutting grass. I, I worked like 25 jobs. I kid you not. Different jobs between the time I started working as a kid and by the time I finally quit working. I worked 25 different jobs just hustling. Whatever you could, I could think of going through school. These, this is this is hero, hero action, you know, being there for people, providing, you know, because anybody can quit and say I, I can't do this, you know, anybody can give up, you know, two jobs, working the way we people have to work in this country, you know, sometimes it's not because you don't have livable wages. This is hero work. That's what a, a real hero is. And and so Luke, he's not getting paid for it either. He's got to get up. And he's got to do it anyway. So that's the, that's what I think it makes him relatable. Um, my question is more about Luke's emo emotional arc um, from where we first see him on Jessica Jones. He's working in a bar, nobody knows who he is, he's kind of hiding, to where we see him in season two. He's, you know, out in the neighborhood, taking selfies with people, wearing sponsorships, and, like, 
you know, like you were saying, he finally accepted the man. Or what? What do you feel? And what we've seen of his journey so far has contributed to him accepting that mantle and being where he is now. Um, it's 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 more it's, it's less of a mantle and more of a um, it's it's he's sort of. I, I mean, I always see people say you drink the Kool Aid. Sometimes you you have a thing where. You know, fame sometimes it has these trappings, and, and you know, Lucas he's human, so he's got the same things that the same problems that other people have. Eventually, you, you start to believe your own hype. Sometimes, as far as like you know, you as it being a superhero in Harlem, you're walking around going, well, you know, I can do anything, right? You know, people believe you, you get hyped up. You know, people and the kids, you know, you, you're a little you're a celebrity. So he goes from being someone who's hiding because he's got a past, he's got things he's trying to you know keep from people, he's got his abilities, he's 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 on the run from the law. He goes from that to freedom. He's exonerated. He's uh, uh, a minor celebrity of sorts. Um, he's got the strength that people you know admire. It's not something that people are trying to like, you know, like he's not a freak. People are going, this is cool. You know, he's trying to figure out how to make some money off of this. He's got all these things that he's got the potential, right? He's got all this potential. So the journey for Luke from, from Jessica, from being this bar a guy who's just trying to keep lay low to being, you know, sucked into this world of, of being a superhero, um, maybe going to a heroes for hire kind of aspect, who knows where he's going. He's going on a journey because he's got a, a set of skills I was like a line from uh, is it from um, uh, Liam Neeson? He's, you know, he's got a he's got a certain set of skills or something like that, right? Is that what it is? Yeah, I love that line because that's what he's got. He's got those skills and he's got to do something with them, you know. So um, he's figuring things out. But the journey the journey is not over yet, um, and he's gonna make some some bad moves, I'm sure. You know, he's gonna make some 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 pro some, some 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 mistakes. And hopefully we can find a way to bring him back to, to the hero that we believe that he is. But we also have to, to explore that part because that's part of being a leader, you know, failing, you know, failing and, and messing up and figuring out how to get back on your feet because it's not always going to work out the way you want it to. So leading off of that, I won't warn everybody, this may be a bit of a spoiler if you haven't seen the whole series, but you talked about earlier the moral aspects, how when you're a good guy, you have to stick to being a good guy. And in the end, Mar Mariah gives him the club to be his siren to pull him away from that. Do you think she accomplished her goal when she did that? Uh, she, she's fired to, to do the club to what? I'm sorry, I missed that last part. Uh, to be the siren, to pull him away oh. from his path. Yeah, I think that was a, that was a, 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 very, a very strategic move to sort of, um, to sort of, it's like a curse, you know, it's like, all right, you know, we, we, I'm gonna find out how to ruin you, like ruin your life, basically, it's like, because the club is a curse, in a way. It doesn't, people don't, I don't think people see it that way, because it's like, oh, the club, you got all these musical acts that come in there, it's a, it's a source of income, people come there, it's like, a, it's like an epicenter of Harlem, all the stuff goes through the club, but ultimately, you know, the club is, nothing more than trappings of, of, of the success and fame because he's got to now try to figure out how to do this thing on the up and up. I mean, it's one thing to point the finger at somebody and say, that's not how you do this or that's not what I would do, but now you got to deal with it. And so he's sort of like, he sort of believes that he can, he can find a way to navigate the system. He can find a way to be better than the system. And now we're going to see how he handles it because he's right in, he's right in the lion's den. He's in the throne. So um, it was a very strategic move on her part. It was like a, it was like a, a curse before she left. Um, my question is, have you ever had to use a good or a bad memory to help fulfill a scene to make a director's vision more real? Yeah, you're always we recall. You're always doing imagination. You know, um, some people do sense memory. I think imagination. Your imagination, like if you've never, if you've never if you, if, let's say when you're like when you're very young, people imagine a lot of things. Imagination is very, very vibrant. If you don't have never experienced something, then you have to find a way to imagine it. Try to figure out how it would feel. You have to go there mentally and figure out how that would feel because ultimately, you know, you still have to play the character. But you may have never done anything like that. A lot of times, you you, you play a drug addict. I mean, if you don't do drugs, you have done that drug, you don't even know what that feels like. So you have to go figure out what that is. Maybe you have to go look at video of someone who's actually going through withdrawal or who's someone who's um, on the drug. It, those, are, those are research things that you have to use. But um, yeah, that, all those things are things that you employ to get where you need to be in the scene or the actor, yeah. Good evening, Mr. Coulter, and thank you for being here. Hello. Um, Hello. My questions are, 
Uh, did you enjoy your time working with Dorian and Simone Missick? Um, they are Cockroach and Misty Knight yeah. in season two. And also, how did your theater background impact your film background? And oh, that was uh, theater. Theater and, and, and film are kind of the same. I mean, you just you, it's just a different way of uh, communicating the same the same uh, uh, work is just captured differently. Um, there's really, you're not supposed, there's not supposed to be much difference between stage and film or anything like that. The, yes, projection and the way you play things, the fourth wall, this kind of stuff, it's very technical. But ultimately, the training from theater will, will usually put you in a good place for everything because you can always make adjustments to a person's performances, if, uh, whether from a theater actor to a TV to a film actor. There's minor adjustments that are technical, but ultimately, everything else is kind of the same. Um, going to uh, Dorian, I, I'd known Dorian for uh, a while. He was actually in Soldier's Play with me when we first did this, this, this uh, the play. Um, and then I didn't meet Simone until we got on set, and they had gotten married a couple of years before, and I hadn't seen I hadn't seen him for uh, about a year or so. So he had gotten married, never met her. She comes on set, and now we have a scene. <laughs> we have a we have a love scene. It's like, oh, okay, well, um, you know, awkward could be awkward, more, more awkward. I don't know, it's awkward, but you know, it's awkward. What can you do? What can you do? Um, and uh, yeah, so but those guys are. It, it, it's it's great to work with them because I remember having them on set at the same time a couple times and it's, it's nice because you know obviously it's nice to, it's nice to have your spouse at work you know you know I'm not saying all the time probably not work nice to work all the time for your spouse but you know when you when you, when you spend a lot of time away and always you know always working it's nice to have days where you're working together or on the set it's just it's nice you know it's it's a nice uh, it's a nice advantage not have to worry about like schedules because you're going to be on set at the same time same day so it was it was fun to have that happen for them and it was fun to have all of us work together fun to have doing, you know, on set, so it was great. Hi, Mike. So I have three questions. So my first question was... Um, we give three? Who oh, give three? We don't... <laughs> Sorry, wait a minute. Now. I don't think you got... Wait a minute. Now. Okay, three. we'll get short. We'll All right, we'll, we'll go one at a time. We'll see if I like them. I'll just <laughs> skip one. I'll pass. It's like a lifeline. I'll just pass. <laughs> so the first question is, what was it like working with Mustafa? The second question is, do you find yourself using Patois every now and then? And my third... So, sorry, say what? Do you find yourself using, like, Jamaican terms? Patois. Jamaican, oh, Patois, yeah, yeah. yeah go ahead, uh -huh. Yeah, and then the third question is, did you ever get annoyed wearing the same hoodies, like switching every single time with the bullets and stuff? Well, yeah, like I'll just answer in reverse. I hate, I, I, get, I really get tired of wearing the hoodies, because the hoodies, either usually it's too hot to wear the hoodie, or something's up. It's, it's always a reason that the hoodie's uncomfortable. And I get, and I also get, you know, it gets tired of wearing the same costume. It's like, this is the same thing, I'm wearing the same thing every day. So I, I, I'm ready to, to change it a little bit, you know, just for aesthetics, just to, you know, wear something different. Um, as far as patois, it's funny, you know, I thought, I thought, there's a lot of different takes on the on the on this accents that we did for the second season, and ultimately, you know, I, I thought that Mustafa did a great job with it. Um, I, I do. I, before before we even started doing it, I remember, you know, I'm from South Carolina, and you know, there's a Gullah Islands in off of Charleston. You know? <laughs> You know, Geechee, the Geechee talk, you know, the Geechee talk. So that's kind of like the, it's not Patois, but it's like, you know, you know, Wagwan, you know, something like that. You know, people like, people, so we have the island Car Caribbean uh, influence in, in Charleston, you know, and I went to school, a lot of people from Charleston were there. So I felt very, I was, the reason we got to this point was because me and Cheo were at my birthday party a couple of years ago, and we were listening to, to a radio station, and, and the radio station, I, I plugged in Shaba Ranks. And Shaba Ranks led to all these different other dance hall and Caribbean sounds, Bob Marley, but a lot of other people, you know, just great artists. And every song was great. Every song got better and better. It was never a bad song. We were like, this would be awesome for the soundtrack. We could figure something out. And he was like, yeah, you know, and then he just kept on going with it, kept on going with it. And every month he just kept talking about it. Before you know it, we, he built a season around that, that sort of that culture. Um, and then the other thing was uh, Mustafa, what was it? Mustafa. Mustafa that played uh, Bushman. Well, yeah, Mustafa and I, we, we, we get along great. So he's like, uh, he's like, I was going, he's like a brother from another mother. We, we just, we, we get along great. Um, he, he's, he's just a great actor and, and we just have a fun time on set. It was always good. And uh, yeah, I look forward to working with him again. I'm glad, glad his character did, did, did not get killed off, you know? So we can, we can, we can see him again. Spoiler. I said he could, I didn't say he would. <laughs> spoiler, she said spoiler alert. I'm like, I didn't spoil anything, I said he could. Possibility. 
Um, speaking of villains, um, all the villains on the cage are so great, and my question is if you could play any villain, um, who would you want to be? If I could play any villain uh, on the Avengers? I'm sorry, what, what, okay. Just in general? Oh, any villain in general? Um, I would say... Thanos, right? Yeah! yeah. Right? I mean, if I play a villain, I might play... Might play Thanos, right? I mean, right? Right? I mean, just saying. <laughs> Over here?